chapter number two, Second Timothy chapter number two, and we'll we will start there. We won't start there. That's where we'll go. We're in Second Timothy three. We've looked at these nineteen. Um, you call them whatever you want. End time uh, evil doings uh, of humanity, and uh, we've covered each one, starting from. Uh, men shall be lovers of their own selves. I was, I was looking at the order that this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. So we know that, that they are perilous. Um, I, I haven't proofed uh, the article that I got an email on just a few minutes ago, but it looked like there was maybe uh, an American, American uh, place bombed in Africa today, and there might be a couple servicemen that it took on and Hezbollah is claiming, look, things are crazy and they're crazy everywhere. I think when 9-11 happened in 2001, uh, you know, I, and we, and I don't, I say joke about it, uh, Louisville shut down and I was like, of all places to shut down, like, like terrorists are going to bomb Louisville. But there was a concerned effort that that would take place because of the presence of Fort Knox and the, um, uh, uh, the weekend um, National Guard uh, that's there as well. And so there was, a, there was a, 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 at least some concern about that presence. They think one of the attacks that would take place. You know, Iran is one of the most dangerous cyber attack countries, which I think is, like, you, I would never put that together with them. You know, uh, they're in the desert, and you're like, they have oil, but what, you know, what do they really have there? Like, what city in Iran would you want to go visit if you went on an all-paid vacation? Like, I can't, I don't know if I can name a city in Iran, to be honest with you. Tehran, is that what you said? <laughs> Tehran. You know, so uh, there they are um, doing these cyber attacks. One of the fears is, is that they'll shut down an electrical grid. Shoot, that would be crazy. If you and I are sitting at home and the lights just go out and we can't figure a way for those things to come back on, you know, there's, a, there's a big difference in having your lights go out in the summer and your lights go out in midwinter too. And uh, It's sweaty in the winter, but you can manage. And once it gets cold, it's cold. And uh, without power, you say, well, we got a generator. I'm supposed to go to Bill and Gwen's and and start his generator up. I do that every every winter ish uh, for him, and so going to start a generator up and run through a sequence. And and uh, he you can't stockpile gas anymore because there's so much ethanol in the gas. The gas goes bad, and you think, well, then we'll just go get gas. Well, just a while back when we had all that freezing, they shut the gas stations down because people was everybody was going to go buy. All the gas, you know. So uh, Marcy had had Sam, and Abby had had Lucas. I think Lucas was ten days old, and so Sam wasn't much older than that. And Wayne and I were sharing a generator, running back and forth at lunch to move it to one house to warm it, bring it up at night to warm mine, bring it back middle night to warm his. And you know, we did that for six days to keep heat on for for our wives and those babies. Perilous times in the end times. You know, it's funny how things. As they, as they carry on, uh, they seemingly don't get better. You know, they, uh, you're like, well, if you have wine and it ages, it gets better with age. But it seems like uh, mankind does not get better, although we have m more access to technology and knowledge. Uh, that knowledge is used for power and corruption. And who sets around? Now, and who sits around all day and just sees if they can hack your Facebook account so they can... How, who does that all day long? Like, is there a job in that? You know, is, do you have credit cards attached to that that they can get and, and they can take your money? Who does that? But those are the kind of things that are in these perilous times uh, that we're going to see. And it starts with, in that, in that list of 19, the very first one is men should be lovers of their own self, uh, Men shall be lovers of their own selves. That's the first one. Men shall be lovers of their own selves. That starts uh, the downward progression. From that, since they're lovers of their own self, we saw they're covetous and they're boasters. They're proud and blasphemers. 
They're disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. Now, that just didn't happen. That's the culture that we have uh, facilitated with the, the type of uh, discipline, uh, even the economy. You know, all of those things together have facilitated this kind of idea. Eddie was talking this morning in Sunday school about the things that you love will be the, he was talking to the dads, the things that you love will be the things that, that uh, your kids love. And, and when we got home, we were talking about how, uh, not that the mother's role is not important in the home, but how the dynamics change for the things of God when the dad is plugged into the system. The statistics just go bonkers if the dad is plugged in. The mom is trying to hold it together while, while even in our society where there's, there's, a try to, there's a, an effort for things to be equal between man and women and, and to be the same, really, not equal. I don't even know what that means, but, but to be the same. But there still is this influence in the home of, of a godly man that, that loves the Lord where his wife can thrive in that atmosphere and he can lead his children and they can grow up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And so once men become lovers of their own selves, they, we're a hobby-bound nation. And everybody's got a hobby. We pour our life into our hobbies. Our lives revolve around uh, our hobbies. We all have things that we like. You know, i be honest with you, everybody else is doing their hobby, so why shouldn't you do yours too? You just get tired of, of uh, living to work. I mean, that's all you do is go to work, go to work, go to Who's happy in that? Uh, the owners of the company, you know? Who, who's, who, who benefits from that, you know? And you get to the end of life and what has taken place, you know, they become lovers of their own selves. Covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient parents, and things one holy without natural affection, and that's just, uh, that's ongoing. We could preach on that for the remainder of, of the time. Truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, they, they, they are without power, fierce, despisers of their own, uh, despisers of those that are good. And it's just such a different dynamic in the stuff you see. Um, no, no, We don't want anybody to be shot, but uh, is the guy that took down the gunman in the church, is he a hero or a villain? And I think anybody with a sane mind would say, man, he was a hero. Now he's going to have to live with that execution for the remainder of his life. And and maybe the Lord will give him the grace to do that and he can uh, decipher between what needed to be done and what was done. But, but so many of t- people have taken that incident and spun it that he was the one that was evil. You know, and that he was the one that was bad. He was the one that made the wrong decisions. Had they had a gun-free zone. I mean, aren't you tired of hearing that? Had the church been a gun-free zone, then the villain wouldn't have brought a gun into the sanctuary. Now, who in their right mind agrees with that? But there's people that believe that. The highest rate of crime in our nation are in gun-free zones, period. And you can just say Chicago, and you don't have to say no more. You just take, that's where, that's where a predator looks for the opportunity. You know where deer run? You know, if we go up to Muscat Attack, we get drawn from Muscat Attack, and we go hunt, and they're in Muscat Attack uh, River and all of that surrounding area. You know where the deer are when you leave that place? They're out in the no hunting zones. You know why? Because hunters can't take guns out there. It's the one hunter that walks out there that has a field day. And you say, yeah, but it was a no hunting zone. Those laws only exist for those that are willing to obey them. And they say, well, if we got rid of all guns, guess what? You're not going to do that. That's not going to happen. So we diminish the value of the individual that takes out the perpetrator. But then what do we do? Uh, I I think, was it uh, Ohio maybe last week opened their, uh, they can now sell not medical marijuana, just marijuana. And so the governor of the, Illinois. So the governor of the state was the first one to buy marijuana in the state. And they had a video over there making her first purchase. And I was just like, so we celebrate that and we downplay. And you see how they are despisers of those that are good. You know what? I'll be honest with you. If you good people would go away, we could have fun. Because then it would be lawlessness. And that's what, that's what life is without 
you could say rules. Every kid over here is just like, I hate rules. Rules are, are standards by which we keep ourselves right with God. Where, there's, where there are no rules, there is chaos. Man does, man does not seem to, to discipline himself unless he's under the authority of discipline. Like, what, what makes you do the speed limit? What makes you stop at the stop sign? There was an article this morning that I read Donnie Ross had sent to me, and, and the article just asked the question, what, in a perfect world, what would your idea be of a police officer? And there, and there was an entire article on it because... I think police officers no longer know what they're supposed to do. And not that he would ever watch this, but if he does, he's gonna, he will email me bad things when I say this. But you know, Marcy and I were headed up uh, the interstate the other day, headed to Henryville, and, uh, and two state cops passed us doing 100 miles an hour up the, uh, the fast lane. And you say, well, they were maybe headed somewhere. They didn't have their lights on. Well, they don't, they don't have to have their lights on. I mean, I, I've been in that vehicle with those officers breaking the speed limit where I've tapped the dude driving and said, hey, do the speed limit. And he's like, oh, you're one of those. One of those what? Do we uphold the law or are we above the law? So you know, the whole... And somebody's going to get mad at me because the fast lane's the fast lane. How fast are you allowed to go in the fast lane? The speed limit or over the speed limit? The speed limit. Get out of the way. It's the fast lane. Faster than the guy doing 45 maybe because it's 65. But it's still just 65. Like you don't get to do 90 in the fast lane because it's called the fast lane. No, but it's just like, you know what, there's so, much frivol there's so much frivolous crime anymore, we're no longer going to prosecute that until, and you guys know it because you live here with me, until they need to meet their quota and they sit down on I-65 and they just write a bazillion tickets, you know, for five days and then they disappear. And that's over because they're probably back in their office doing all the paperwork and going to all the, the court visits. And then it's over. You know, it's, it is, they are, to me, uh, downright, I don't know what we're going to do next, what on earth, woe is me, ah, uh, no, not that kind. But they are perilous times because I can see what's coming in all of that. It's a police state or a no police state. It's either complete, complete control or without control. You either are the king of your castle or you're just a peasant in the castle world. And that's, that's what we see progressing. And people just always say, man, come on, that's crazy. You're crazy. And that is the slow burn of the frog. He's just sitting in the boiling water thinking, man, it's getting warm in here, but I kind of like it. And the next thing you know, he's just frog legs and frog back. You know, and somebody's eating and making a good meal out of him, and that's it. It's just, and you know what it's doing? You know what these things are doing to us? They're infiltrating our lives. You know what we get tired of watching? Everybody else having their cake and eating it too. And we don't decipher between what the Word of God says and what reality is. And we say, you know what, I'm tired of it. I want to have my cake and eat it too as well. And so we, we slip down that slippery slope. John G. Butler says, let's, let's finish up there. Having a form of godliness, verse 5, having a form of godliness, denying the power thereof, that was, that was last week's. They were tra traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. And I, and I said last week, just in passing, they're not de they, they would willingly accept the power of God, but what they are doing is they're denying the capacity or ability of the power of God because of the list that we just, just read. God's power cannot be in that. And so what is the warning? In, in each of the 19 things, I've tried to address them in, in the fashion that if this is what we see, how should the Christian act? And there is, there is a reciprocal, an opposite, in every, every uh, uh, poor direction here, there is a righteous direction for the believer. Tonight, what, of those 19 things, we're given 
a, a short warning, and we're just going to look at that before we address on in the weeks to come. From such turn away, there are just four words that say there, that list there. From such turn away. You know, repentance is an interesting thing. Uh, repentance paints the idea of going in the opposite direction of which you were headed. If you had, if you had wronged God, repentance is turning your back to that wrong and heading in the wrong, right choice. It's a conscious decision. What was that conscious decision? Every step is in a specific direction, either away from the things of God or towards the things of God. And so in that, in that order, it's not turning my back to what is wrong. And, and, I, and, and I feel like this is, where, this is where I have struggled in my walk with God. And so I'm just saying because of we all live in the same melting pot of, of sin and wrong in the same area, I, I'm just assuming that, and that could be a bad thing, but I'm just assuming that we are all dealing with the same things. And the thing is, is that God's been faithful. The Holy Spirit has been faithful. Conviction has been faithful. The Word of God's been faithful. And I turn my back to that which is wrong, and the whole time I'm walking away, I'm looking back at it. Because there's still some kind of, of lust and desire in me that says, I know it's not right, but I don't want to wholly give it up. And if I get over here and it's not as good as it was over there, I'm going back. And we wouldn't say those things out loud to God, but our actions do those things. He says from such, from this list, if you see these things, from this list, turn away. I read this to, to Aaron right before he goes to sleep. He likes me to read to him. And so I read this. John G. Butler says, This command to part from evil applies to more evils than just the last evil. The, the last evil there would be um, having a form of godliness, denying the power thereof. He's not saying just turn away from verse number 5. He's saying turn away from, if you see any of those things in the list, turn away from those on the list. He says a, re, a religion that has form but no substance. So there are there is, and, and we see it, and you say, man... It's, you're so judgmental, you know, we eat one another, we tear each other down. There, there's a lot going on. But we see today, we see a form of godliness. They, have a, they draw nigh unto me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. They can, they can raise their hands and go to concerts and have lights and have smoke, and, but they leave that place and go to the bar on the way home and talk about how great the Christian concert was. And so... There is a, there's a form. They draw nigh to Him with their lips. They praise the Lord. They praise the Lord. They praise the Lord. But let's just be honest. If the amount of people today, even our country, that were, were donning the doors of church just this Sunday morning love the Lord, our country would just be in a different state that it's in. But we cannot get the masses. We cannot get the masses to love the Lord. To, to reflect in their own personal walk with God. And, and let's just say, let's just be honest, it's not the masses. Because we could say, we could say, we can't get the pastors to love the Lord. We can't get the youth pastors to love the Lord. We can't get the song leader to love the Lord. We can't get the Sunday school teacher to love the Lord. There just seemingly is no position anymore where there is personal separation from the world and a desire to have the power of God. And you see that verse comes to life, denying the power thereof. We're really good at doing it on our own because we've just got really good at doing it. But where is the power of God? And why doesn't the Spirit of God pour down on the people? And why isn't there weeping and their repentance and change and, and a coming to? Because we're just, I, I, in preaching on hope and faith, we, are, we, we tend to the definition more of hope like luck. We hope that it happens and we just get lucky that it happens instead of doing the work. You know, Eddie said this morning, if, if the Lord was going to return in five years, if, if the Lord just... Zoom down here and said, I'm coming back in five years, to, within five years to take the church. You don't know if it'll be next Sunday or in five years. How would our life change for God? 
And, and I know the way that we procrastinate and the way that we live, we would try to just keep doing what we're doing right up to the last second. And then that week before, you know, the week before revival, the Lord really speak to my heart. I'm going to read my Bible this week. I'm going to spend some time in prayer, make it to a revival. I really need you to work in my life. I don't even know if we asked that. But the week before, we try to get our heart ready. And we're really, we're behind the curve. Like, it, we should have started at the end of the last revival prepping for the next Sunday, and the next Sunday, and the next Sunday. Lord, speak to my heart. Talk to me. You know, change me. Help me to follow you. Guide my steps. That, that's the conversation that we're having. He says, so the command applies to all 19 of the evils cited. Separation from evil has been exhorted repeatedly in these epistles in uh, to Timothy. Look back in chapter number 2. I think, um, I think I can find both of them. Just in chap chapter uh, number 2, verse 15, one of our memory verses, we're going to study our self, self, uh, uh, show ourselves approved unto God, work when not me, me might be shamed, right divine word of truth. He says, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. This is why we're turning away, because what do the babblings do? What do the profane babblings do? You know, and, and I don't even know if those are just wives' tales or what, but they are just babblings. The Bible says that we are to speak thou the things that become sound doctrine, that our words would not be condemned. And so we're, we're not just rambling and babbling with a bunch of sayings. Look, at the way we learn sayings and lyrics, we should have learned the Bible. And so if we would have just taken those lyrics of songs that, you know, I can hear... I can hear, John, I can hear three beats of a song and sing the first two verses in the chorus. I mean, secular stuff, just from being lost and it's just driven in there, driven in there. You can hear, you can hear a guitar. I don't know if I can do it. What's that? Look at it. What is it? Sweet Home Alabama. I mean, you can just hear those. Some of you are like, that's not Sweet Home Alabama. That was my rendition. That's what I hear. <laughs> you know, that's what, but that's, we can hear those. What's the, what's right at the beginning of that song? Jeff, what's right at the beginning of that song? What are the first words of that song? The real first words of that song. Turn it up. Yep. Oh, is that it? Turn it up. What do you do? It's going to be good, man. You know, and so we are, we are exposed to that stuff. If I could, if I could, uh, if, I could if I could, if I could just give some notes, the beginning of a Hank Williams Jr. song, Ed, you think you could probably tell me which song it was? I mean, it just, that stuff, it appeals to our flesh. And because, I would say because we like it, we pay attention to it. And I'm saying what if. Maybe it should be, but what if, like, the Word of God and preaching and hymn songs, we made that what appealed to us. Man, I love, I love preaching. Uh, man, I, I love, in that one hymn, John Stewart comes in all the time singing something. Singing, you heard this? You heard this? You heard this? Marcy read, uh, she's not in here. Marcy read a thing to me the other day. It just was a, it was not a Christian post. It was a power and positive thinking post. And the post said, if you would listen to three religious uplifting songs every day, and I don't know where they come up with their percentages, but you would be 70% more likely to have a good day. And that was, it's just a secular, like they realize the power in singing about the cross, singing about the Redeemer, singing about the warning that, that's given there is shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. So do we do it? Do we think that we are the exception to the rule? Well, Lord, I can listen to that stuff and I still love you. Because the Word of God's not true. 
And see how we become lovers of our own selves? Lord, I'm going to have you and what I want at the same time on a high level. And I'm just like, no, you're not. I mean, because a bunch of us have tried to do it. And people have tried to do it down through the years, and it just never happens. He says, and their word will eat at the canker of whom Hymenus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. That's a different rendition of that re reading. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. It's not what? It's not tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. It's not driven with, driven with the wind. It's not... Uh, uh, the foundation of God will not increase more and more ungodliness. You know, physical exercise profiteth little, but godliness profiteth unto all things. It standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are His. And let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. It's just a command, depart from iniquity. Look in verse 21. <coughs> if a man therefore purge himself of these... Talking about those uh, things of wood and of earth. He shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified meat for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. But when I became a man, what did I do? I put away childish things. Flee youthful lusts. They're, they're bad for your health. They're bad for everything. They're bad for your marriage. They're bad for your kids. They're bad for the work environment. They're all bad. And he says for us to flee those lusts. Butler says, separation from evil has been exhorted repeatedly in the epistles to Timothy. Why, why do you think they were... They're given to us through Timothy, and I'm supposing for two reasons. One, because Paul's older, and so he's experienced some things, and two, Timothy's young. And because he's young, he's easily taken off course. And he says, the command applies to all 19 evils. Separation from evil has been exhorted repeatedly in the epistle to Timothy. One cannot fraternize, fraternize with evil without becoming contaminated with evil. You know what happens if you handle horse poop? You get the poo on you. <laughs> That's what happens. You go out to the horse barn and you walk around any time at all and Marcia will say, if you go down there, when you come up, take your boots off before you come in the house because she don't like that smell. And you really don't, you don't even have to get in it anymore in the barn. The ground is contaminated with it and it's just on your boots. And she'll walk in the front door. Boots will be sitting at the back door. And as soon as she'll walk in, she'll go, whose boots are in here that were in the barn? And Sam or somebody will say, I didn't get in anything. You got in the barn. And because you fraternized with where the horses defecate, and we pick it out and clean it and all that good stuff, put in new dirt, but because you were out there, that smell is on your person. And that's how evil is. We fraternize. I'm just going to play with it. I'm not going to go into it. not going to go down to it. not going to give in to it. But it does what? It, it affects our dreams. It affects our language. Evil communications corrupts good manners. And that's what it does. And, and I will say, the Lord says, be holy for I am holy. The more sanctified and or holy you become in your walk with God, the more you're aware of those things around you. You hear them. Now we sat in breakfast this morning. And one guy sitting a couple of tables from us. And I mean, bam, 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 bam. And you hear it more. Like, you expect it a little. But when somebody says two sentences and they string together the F word six times, you notice it. Okay, dude. If your vocabulary is so poor that you can't use English language, 
than be quiet in the presence of my kids. The fear is, is that you respond to that, hey, my kids are in here. I don't care. This is a paying establishment. They don't like it. Get out. People don't have respect for it no more either. They don't care. They're vulgar. And, and, I'll, and I'll say that in, in that setting, it's, there's, you, you could say maybe way back when, man, I'm glad the ladies don't talk like that. It's at least equal, if not worse. And they'll say to Jeff, man, you need to have a sign on your door that says the pastor's in here. You know, and I've said that before. But I mean, it's at least equal. That's how, that's how evil works. You play with evil, you, come, you become contaminated with it. You piddle in this, in this list just a little bit, and you become contaminated with it. It changes your speech. It changes your habits. He says the temptation in evil times is to compromise with evil. Paul's exhortation to separate from evil counters that temptation. Because what, what is the counter to that list? From such turn away. That's the counter. From such turn away. Well, Lord, I don't know if I have the strength. You do. It depends on which dog you feed. It just depends on which dog you feed. And, and I will say in this congregation, because there's a lot of hobbies and a lot of things that we, we're habit forming people, we're in a country setting, and we do the same things over and over and over. And there's probably a whole lot of things that we do that are not bad in and of themselves. Probably a, a, if you were going to say, how good is your congregation? Probably a pretty good congregation. But once you take any secular object and that begins to trump the godly objects that are in your life, that good secular object will draw you away from just the truths alone of the Word of God. Because you will you get into that habit, that habit forming, habit forming, habit forming. I'll, I'll be honest with you, being in a bad mood is can, can very much be a habit. You know, being in a good mood can just be a habit. You can form that habit in the way that you think, in the things that you say. I mean, when the Bible says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. I mean, why can't you say, well, I'm a happy man? And you could say, because you're not. Well, but does that, do I have to let you define who I am? Or can I just be who I want to be for God? And you say, he's been happy for a few days. He's been happy for a few weeks. He's been happy for a few months. And you know what? Nobody ever talking about it anymore because people just be like, ah, he's always happy. It'll just be out of the norm. From such, that list of things, from such, turn away. Turn back with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. There's a lit, there is, so I shortened my list. There's, you know, I had 60 verses to. 40 verses to 20 verses to every every book in the Bible has the has the same outline as far as as the presence of evil and our fiddling with it or being a part of it. 2 Corinthians 6.17 says, Therefore come out from among them, be ye separate. That's one that we know. Say it the Lord, touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you. That's one that we know. So what are we to do of that list? We're not, we're to, uh, from such turn away, we're to come out from among it. Like, the, the language there in 2 Corinthians uses this language, let it not be once named among you that becometh the saints of God. So it's not like that you can fraternize with it. He says, let, just absolutely do not let it even be named among you that you may be a part of something that is a part of that. 1 Thessalonians 5.22 says, abstain from all, and man, it's a, probably one of the most hated verses in all the Bible. 
abstain from all appearance of evil. Because there are those things that are not evil that you have the authority and probably privilege and right to do, but somebody could misconstrue it as evil. And, I, and, I, and I'm with you. I've got enough to think about with not trying to think about what everybody else is thinking about and thinking about me too. And that's why God gave us the Holy Spirit. So we can feel the tug of the heart and the conviction of the Lord to say yes and no. Look, as much as I'm trying to preserve myself in my walk with God, God's power is trying to preserve me even the more for the cause of Christ. So if I can learn to take my hands off of the panic button and, and be in tune with the Holy Spirit, then the Holy Spirit can lead me. And you've, you've heard this example, but if I, if I pluck a G-string on this guitar, the G-string in that piano will vibrate. You know, there, there are two strings on... On this, on this guitar, the top string and the bottom string are both E's. And that bottom E is flat, but you can tell. I mean, they are out of tune. And even if you don't have an ear for tune, you can, you can hear when it comes in tune and those waves stop fighting one another that that is the that's the idea in our in our walking with the holy spirit look he plucks the e string and our string e string vibrates we're not out of tune with him we don't say things like i'm going to do it anyway we don't say say things like i have a right to do it you know we we say Lord, I, I don't want to hinder the, your power in my life. See, and that's where that denying the power there is. God wants to do what? He wants to turn you into a, a generator of the power of God. We're always dialing back the power with our actions. You know, we need to make sure that, that, that we are not dialing it back, that, that we are running at full capacity. We're not using cheap gas. We're using Holy Spirit gas. It's, it's driving us, the best stuff we can place in. So we're abstaining from even the appearance of evil. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, in verse 23, there is this portion of Scripture is, is talking, he's using the idea of meat, because the church at Corinth is is concerning whether or not they're going to eat meat that's offered to idols. When do you eat it? When don't you eat it? When? And that's what the whole discussion about. But Paul addresses it in a broader sense and in application from this, from this, from such turn away. In verse uh, 23, it says, All things are lawful to me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. And that would be the the crux, crux of the whole entire portion of Scripture. Like all things are lawful to me. Guess what? You know what? You know what happens when you're saved? Your position is sealed. You are without sin. So can I do evil and wrong? Absolutely. And I, and I hate to address it that way in, with them, but, but absolutely. Why? Because you have an advocate with the Father and you are positionally forgiven. And so you can do wrong. The question then becomes a matter of choice. Do I want the power of God on my life? Or do I want the chastising power of God on my life? We can either humble ourselves or He can humble us. You know, and, and so you can live as a born-again Christian always under the humbling hand and chastisement arm of the Lord. And it just looks like you're not having any fun as a Christian. And guess what? You're not. Because you're not fighting yourself and you're not fighting the world. You're fighting God. And because God loves you and He's bought you with a price, look, I mean, this dog will hunt. Like, and He don't get tired either. And so He's going to carry on, carry on. He might bring you home short because of all of that action. Look, choose to do right. Choose to live right. Choose to make right choices. And so all things are lawful to me. I can do anything I want to do. Anything that I want. Man, and if you negate, if you take the power of the Holy Spirit off of the, of the influence, off of the world, 
man, man will just do anything that he wants because there will be no controlling power at all. And when we're looking at there in the book of Ruth, the last chapter in the book of Judges, in the last verse said, uh, every man did that which was right in their own eyes. Man, you talk about chaos and you talk about wrong. Well, I wanted more of that property. What's well, not yours? Boom. Now who's there to defend it? The wife and kids? I mean, part of the message this morning in Ruth, in the, in the uh, change of, of designation that I didn't get to, was, was the fact that Ruth and Naomi were living without a husband, without a man. There was no one to work the field. There was no one to, there was not a husbandman. And so part of that uh, Leverite marriage was putting that individual back in place and in uh, Ruth is, Ruth's life, Boaz, who would then be what? A sense of protection and cover and work and providing and all of those things. And they would work then together. So Paul continues in his instruction in the behavior of faithfulness to divine character and commands, guides these instructions, the principles. First, the, the expediency in the principles. Some conduct may be correct, but it's not helpful to others. And that would be the simple form of it. Some conduct is correct, but it's not helpful, helpful for others. And that's, what, that's the warning there. And abstaining from all appearance of evil, and that's what he's addressing here is that if... There are, there are three different scenarios by which you could just eat the meat. You know, if you bought it uh, at the market, uh, if you went to somebody's house and just ate it, um, if it was prepared at a meal, like a setting of a meal, but if anybody said that this is meat that's been offered to idols, he said, don't eat it. You know, that was the rub. Because there would be people there that were maybe young in the Lord that were trying to determine all of those things. Well, when can we... Can we eat the meat and when can't we eat the meat? And they see, you know, Roger or Ed, they see them walk over and, and there sits Logan. And he's like, man, I don't know if you can eat that meat or not. And he sees Roger and Ed go over and just cut off some meat that's been offered to idols. And he goes, oh, yeah, you can eat that. And then he starts teaching for what is wrong as right. So it's like it's lawful. Why? Because... They know. There's no other God than God. You can offer me to idols all day long. There are really, there are no idols because they don't exist. And so you can eat that meat all day long. But not if you cause your brother to stumble. Then you better to be better off to go without. But I was hungry. See, that's a problem. That's a problem. We're always hungry. You know, we're hungry for the things that we shouldn't have. We're not hungry for the things that we should have. And so he says all things are lawful, <clears throat> but they're not expedient. Second, the, the edification and the principle. Some conduct may be correct, but it does not profit spiritually oneself and also others. Even the conduct is correct. And Paul is giving this warning. Look at verse 24. Let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. You know what the word wealth there means? doesn't mean financial. It means welfare. Don't seek your own welfare, but every man, another man's welfare. And man, you live in a culture like we do today, and you offer yourself up to help people, and you'll have a line 400 miles long, and there ain't enough of you to go around. I mean, that, that's how it is. And so you're like, what? how much do I do? What do I do? What's my limit? Where do I cut off? When do I say? What? Those are tough questions. I'd say the, the, this command, if I was going to say this is a command to who, I would say this is a command to the body of Christ. Like We can't just become a welfare individual, church, or state for the community alone, and that's all that we do because you would just have a line here all of the time. Because there's people that will just take and they will never give and they will never help. You know, I talk about teach a man to fish. You know, bring a man a fish, he can eat for one day, teach him to fish. He can feed himself for whatever, forever how long. You know, we're, it's much easier for us to just throw money at stuff instead of taking the time to do those things. You need help. 
And we live, we just live in a society where people know they need help and they don't care. They're looking for somebody to give them help where they have to do make no effort to get it. And if you won't, there'll be another one that will. And when I, I remember early in the ministry visiting uh, <coughs> an inmate down at um, the Grange in the penitentiary, and uh, he was from Charlestown, and. I asked Tom Craig to go with me the very first time because I said, man, I'll go down there and I'll give him everything. I'll give him a key to the house. Like, when I get there, I don't, I don't know what I'm supposed to do, when to stop, when not to stop. I would like to take you as a buffer. And he said, okay. So he went with me. We went into this room. They brought this guy in. He was shackled. They shackled him to the table. He's sitting down there. And before I knew it, Tom Craig was giving him everything but the kitchen sink. And I was like, hey, dude, you were supposed to be the buffer, not wait, stop. Don't, no. You know, and we left, and Tom was like, I just, I had a broken heart for him. And I was like, I won't ever take you back. Like, what? So the next time I went back, they made me wait outside in this room, and I didn't know what I was waiting for. And then they moved me into another room to wait. And I was like, okay, I'm not in jail. Like, you can't just house me. Like, I'm not claustrophobic, but I didn't want to be stuck a phobic either. Like, I was ready to get out of that place. And then finally, an officer came in, a Christian officer, and he said, are you ready, Mr. Ball? And I said, yeah, what am I doing? And he said, oh, he had another pastor in there, and he was visiting with him. And man, it, I got mad. It just made me mad. So I went in into the room, sat down, and he was just like, man, I really need you to put $20 in my commissary account. I'm broke. And and I was like, you're a liar. What? I was like, you are a liar. I said, there was another pastor in here. I said, like, you working more than one people? I've got people in my church that have given their hard-earned money to give you, to get you clothes, to get you a radio, to get you soap, to get you like, we have committed to helping you. And you're taking advantage of us. And he said, that's just the way it is. And I said, and I said, and I mean make these bold statements. <laughs> you can do that to other people, but you can't do it to us. My people love God. They fear the Lord. Like You can take advantage of people that are just going through the motions. You won't do it to us. And he goes, I'll do whatever I want. And I said, God will visit you, buddy. So he got out, he got out of jail not long after that. Uh, Doug Curry went to his house, knocked on the door. said, I've got a job for you. You want to come to work? And he said, I, I'm not working. And Doug went on to have a conversation with him. He said, nope, I've got, there were three churches in Charlestown and us that he was, that he was working. And I actually called the other pastors and said, hey, I've been down to see him. I've been down to see him. I've been down to see him. Doug Curry made that visit that night. It was on a Saturday. We had church on Sunday and Doug Curry told me about the visit he made, and Doug, he was like me, he was mad. He was just like, man, God's going to visit him. Monday morning at 7 o'clock, Doug Curry called me, and I woke up, and I said, hey, what's going on? He said, you read the paper? I didn't know where you get the paper. <laughs> just be honest with you. I said, nope. He goes, I'll take a picture of this obituary and send it to you. I said, okay. There was that guy that we knew stood up in his living room. His chest exploded, and his heart, and his heart blew up, and he bled out right there on the floor. And Doug Curry was like, don't mess with God. Don't mess with God. It's, it's not a thing where we just play and play and play God for what God can give me. He gave us His life. There really is nothing more to give to us. Anything we get outside of that is just the privilege of being a part of the family of God. But I can deny myself those things if I fiddle with evil. You know, I've said before, and I look across the playing field in the morning, and the war's about to begin, and I say, man, what's the Lord doing over there? I promise you, friend, you're on the wrong side of the playing field. You've, you've shacked up with the wrong group, and now you've got swords, and you're carrying on against the things of God, and, and nobody's ever beaten, and nobody will ever beat. And so there is, there's, there's edification in the principle of, of how am I edifying because I'm not doing the things that are expedient to me that are causing the stumbling block for my brother and or sister and or kids or family in Christ. There's, there's priority in the faithfulness. Let no man seek his own. But every man, another man's welfare 
his wealth. The word wealth speaks of welfare. This text is not teaching seeking another person's money, but seeking another person's welfare. The text is related to the expedient exhortation above. We are not to live just for ourselves, but must consider the effect of our conduct upon other people. And then that's, that. I mean, I say that's tough. That's the road we walk. That is the road we walk. The question I ask of the old preacher, I've got a, a revival hymn that I listen to every once in a while, and the preacher asks in the midst of the preaching, he says, how on earth could the world not get along with the holiest man that ever lived, but it gets along with you? Our presence because of God in us should already begin the friction that exists because of God in me. Now, I'm trying to produce the friction with charity and love, but the friction exists because we have two different eternal destinations and they are opposing forces, the good dog and, and the bad dog. The priority and the faithfulness, let no man seek his own. He says, let no man seek his own, but every man knows. Whatsoever is sold in the shambles that eat, ask no questions for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. Many of them believe not, bid you to eat the feast. And you dispose to go, whatsoever is set before you, eat, asking no question for conscience sake. But if any man say, this is offered to sacrifice unto idols, eat not for his sake that showed it, and for the conscience sake, for the earth of the Lord and the fullest of error. Conscience, I say, not thine own, but of, thy, of the other. For why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? Whew, man, that's, why, why is my freedom judged by the conscience of Aaron? Because I'm a leader. And, and I may be a servant leader. We read today the word servant occurs six times in the Bible. The word, or the word leader occurs six times in the Bible. The word servant occurs 900 times in the Bible. The question was asked then, why are there leadership conferences? You know, there should be servanthood conferences. Learn how to serve others. Learn how to serve others. We're learning how to organize others. Learn how to serve others. Be be a servant. But why is, my, why is my liberty judged by the conscience of Aaron? Because he's watching me. Because the world is watching me. They're making an observation of me. You know, I, I was preaching the second funeral two weeks ago. And right in the midst of the funeral, uh, a guy stood up. And it just unnerved you. Because he stood up and started walking towards me. And I'm like, okay, this is a new one. Like, is he going to the casket? Is he coming to me? Is he going to walk out? Has he heard enough? He was more than I wanted to handle. And he's walking straight at me, and he just stopped and gave me a big old, big old hug, bear hug. I mean, right in the middle of service. Gives me a big old bear hug. Turns around, he's got me by the neck, you know. Alan's my friend. He's a God-called preacher. You need to listen to him. We need This family needs to get straightened out. This is someone God sent him to us. I'm just going, what in the world? You can't preach this stuff, you know. <laughs> then he went and sat back down. I was just like, okay, where was I at? Uh, verse number two. <coughs> because he is what? He's observing. He's observing. He has a bad night, he calls. What are you, the pastor of everybody? No, you can't, you can. But who does he call? You know, most of the Christians he knows are probably sitting at the bar with him. And so who does he call? Like when things, when the rubber meets the road, who does he call? Hey, Alan, you got a few minutes? Can we talk? Go ahead, man. And he just rambles for a long time. Not talking about the Lord. After the funeral, the week following, last week he called and asked, he just asked this question, hey, I got one question of you. All right, do you think I'm a Christian? No. I don't. Well, I thought that would be your answer, but I just wanted to hear it from your lips. I mean, he's standing on the cusp of, of eternity, watching his loved one dies as he 
drinks and drugs himself in the same direction. And God has said, before you go, I want you. And who does he call? Who is it that they call in our circle of influence? We should be that, we should be that individual in that circle of influence. I can always count on them. They will always pray for me. I can always trust them. They're always there. I mean, those, that's the language of us as believers, that we are steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. And so he gives the, he gives the warning just in closing. Verse 26, The earth is Lord and the fullness of it. If any man of them then believe not, bid you go to feast. Then don't eat, asking the question for God's sake. But if any man say unto you, this is offered to sacrifice unto idols, eat not for his sake that, sh- that showed you showed it, for, and for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullest of Conscience, I say, not thine own, but of the other. For why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? For if I by grace be a partaker, why am I evil spoken of for that for which I give thanks? Whether therefore, and this is where the verse comes in. (laughs) This is where the verse comes in that we use all the time. Whether therefore, for the conscience of others, we, we talk about it from a might standpoint. Whether therefore we eat or drink, do all to the glory of God, we talk about it from a might standpoint. Really in its context, it's talking about from an observation standpoint. As others watch us, in their conscience, even in those small, minute things that probably don't matter to anybody but just some, whether I eat or drink, do all to the glory of God for the sake of conscience. Now, whether we eat or drink, I think we should do all to the glory of God for my sake, but in its context, it's from observation's sake. And he says, whether we eat, where am I at? 31, whether we therefore ye eat, or drink, worse do, do all the glory of God, give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. Even as I please all men in all things, not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. The whole ball of wax is for what purpose? What to bring glory to God? In part. To live a righteous life? In part but that so other men and women around us can get saved. So they can see a clear, distinct thread of love for God in our lives. So as as that list dwindles down of 19 things in perilous times, what should we do? We should stand apart. We should stand apart from the world. We should influence the world, the little world that, that we influence. And I always say it, starting with me, starting with my home, starting with my, maybe my neighbor, starting with my job and my circle of influence, then reaching out from there, whether people, my, my doctor or my dentist, whether it would be uh, the girl that, uh, and, uh, and I'd watch Tom Craig's, we, we'd eat with Tom and Rosie, and we, they always go back to the same place, and I don't know why I complain about that, because we always go back to the roadhouse. But uh, they always go Cracker Barrel and Salisbury, Cracker Barrel and Salisbury, Cracker Barrel and Salisbury. And I was like, you always go to Cracker Barrel. He said, you know, waitresses at Cracker Barrel tend to stay at Cracker Barrel longer than any other waitress in the industry. And I said, okay. Like, what does that have to do with the price of beans in China? And he said, because then we'll find one and we find her work schedule and we always go eat when she's there and we talk to her about the Lord and her family and we give her a track. And I'm like, man, you think way, you think a lot about winning people to Christ. and that, I mean, I'm saying it out loud thinking, you know what that means of me? I don't think about it a lot. But that was his life. I mean, he is, I used to say, Tom Craig will witness to anything that moves. When he walks into a room, the fish stops swimming. Like, I mean, he will just tell everybody about Jesus that he crosses paths with. Everybody. And Rosie's as kooky as he is. I mean, she's just the same. Crazy red. I mean, they got tracks and tracks. They got pocketbooks of tracks. They're making tracks, writing tracks. I mean, it's on their mind. Why? Because, man, the purpose of the ministry is for people to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and have an eternal home in heaven. I'm telling you, them two, they would be ashamed of, of me lifting them up. 
but of modern day truly evangelists like telling others about Christ, I'd put them two up against anybody. And they make long-term relationships. Look, Tom Craig's writes with Sean Hannity and Bill Riley and Greg Gutfeld. He corresponds with them. Handwritten letter corresponds with them. They email him back and he sends them verses because he thinks if I could influence a, a newscaster that is influencing the world to trust Christ as their Savior, what kind of influence could they have? And because he's got that Catholic evangelism background and they are a Catholic organization, he's influencing them, influence, sending them scripture, sending them books that he's written, sending them. You know, it's his life. You say, well, I can't be like that. Nobody's asked you. Just do your part for God. Nobody's going to be Tom Craig's and a, and a Rosie Craig's. Nobody's going to be an Alan Ball or an Eddie Mings or a Roger Allen. Nobody's, you are who you are for God. And you live up to that expectation. If you got ten talents, then produce ten talents. If you got five, then do five. Three, do three. Don't take your one and bury it. Don't take your one and bury it. You have some kind of talent that can be used for God and for the glory of God. Use that talent for God. You say, I'm really quiet. That's fine. There are other quiet people that need to know about the Lord. And you can reach them. I'm very loud. I make quiet people nervous. But what did Paul say? I become all things to all men that I might win some. So to the quiet, what did he do? He became quiet. He says, to the weak I became weak. To the strong I became strong. He became all things to all men. Why? Because... That influence of God in his life, he wanted that influence to influence others. From such turn away. Take the list of those things, the, the services and messages that you have. You say, I ain't been here for all. They're on YouTube. Uh, I'll put them in a playlist. And so you can go on there and just click Perilous Times on the playlist, and they'll all be there. Take the list and the things that you struggle with. Uh, put together um, a strategy for getting victory over those things. I really struggle with this. Then make a strategy. The Holy Spirit and the Word of God have done the, the revealing. Now it's left to us to do what? From such turn away. You know, the list is given, then the action's given to us to, to make the change. So you say, well, how many times listen to it until you make the change? Favor it on your playlist? Go back and listen to it again. I'm struggling with this. I need to listen to it again. What's he talking about? How can I? Here are some verses. Write those verses down on a 3 by 5 card. Stick, stick them in, in your truck or your car before you get ready to leave for work. And if you leave late, don't do it. You know, but before you get ready to come home, make a pact with God. Lord, every day I'm going to leave. This was purposing in your heart this morning. Every day before I leave to come home, I'm going to read those verses. I'm going to memorize these verses to combat the things that I struggle with. And you'll find out not, not too long when you start to flitter down that little trail the Holy Spirit will bring those verses back to remembrance. You'll have to fight Him whether you do it or not, but the Lord will be faithful. You say, Lord, help me. He is. You have to accept His help. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Oh, we come tonight. Thank you, Lord, for Your Word. and Thank you.